But it is good to be together, church, right? Yes, it is. And we are we are God's church. We're right here. And we're loving with each other. Good to be together. So we're finishing up Colossians today. All right. So I think we spent five, six weeks in Colossians, and today we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up, and then we'll come back with something new for us from God's Word that we'll begin to walk through together. But uh, we're finished up, up Colossians, and so these in the book of Colossians, these are the his final instructions of Colossians for Christian living. And so we'll try to glean some of this today, you know, get some insight from this as we walk through this portion together this morning. But, uh, you know, it starts out in verse 3, and he says, Devote yourselves to prayer, be watchful and thankful. Okay? And that's all about prayer. It's all about prayer. Devote yourself to prayer. Be watchful and thankful. And so, you know, there's really three big points I want us to grab from this also today. The first is that prayer is essential for Christian living. And that's laid out in your notes for you. Prayer is essential. Can you imagine just never praying? You know, you're going to dry up and shrivel up like one of those raisins. You know, that's not a fun thing to make a song about. Okay? It just, you just, you're, you're not going to have much, well, you're not going to have any vibrancy to your life without some prayer. Because we have an enemy who's working on us all the time. But when he says the bow, different ones of your scriptures will say different words like persevere, continue steadfastly. In other words, this is a big priority. Devote yourself to it. Ironside says this. He says, it's the idea that of a boat okay, that always stands ready for someone to use or for an activity that Someone is devoted to and busily engaged in. So it's kind of like, oh, that, that boat's a, getting used a lot. You know, it's always, you know, and he always, you know, it's just who you are. It's something you do. You're active in it. It's something that you do a lot. Okay? It's something you do a lot. You know, and when we think of prayer, guys, uh, sometimes that prayer uh, entails a real struggle, doesn't it? You know, we're just laboring over an issue with the Lord. And when we have issues like that, He wants us to spend time talking to Him about those struggles. You know, so I'm, if, if something is happening big, I'm for sure devoted to I'm holding that before the Lord. Sometimes, though, and I think devoted is still a good word for it, sometimes, though, our prayers are just those quick little things, right? And uh, you guys might have grown up watching Star Trek. And I always remember, you know, Kirk would hit his little thing here, right? And Kirk to Bridge, right? Kirk to Scotty, he just kind of touch it. And he was in instant communication with people throughout his his ship, right? His, well, they call it a ship, but his spacecraft. By the way, that's make-believe. I mean, you didn't know that. It's not real. <laughs> okay. uh, they haven't really gone through the universe like that. Okay, but that instant communicator. And, you know, for years, it's like that, those, that is probably the bigger part of our prayer life is this stuff, right? Charlie to God, Charlie to God, Charlie to God, Charlie to God. You know, that we're instantly communicating. I, I said for years I should make a pin about that and that we could just wear it, you know, talk to God, talk to God. But that's a big part because when Paul says to pray unceasingly, right? It's just, we're just communing with the Lord all the time. So whether we're devoted to just communicating with Him all the time, or whether we're devoted to, well, this is big, man, I have got to spend time on this. And the next time something big is there, I have got to spend time on this. And Or if it's people that you love, that you're just always holding them before the Lord, you're devoted to always talking to the Lord about those. But it's something you do a lot. And if we give others, think about this in our lives, if we give others uh, time, doesn't the Lord deserve at least that much time? Okay? He probably deserves more. And the other thing is, we should never think that our time is our own. That we can just do with our time whatever we want to do with our time. Because when we, when we look at scriptures, we think, well, well, it's my life, I can do what I want, or it's my time. I can do what I want. Well, in 1 Corinthians 6, we're told that we are bought, right? We are bought with a price. And in 1 Peter, he says this, For you know that God made a ransom to save you from the empty life that you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. 
It was with the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Our life is not our own, and we'd be wise to give God our time of prayer. We'd be wise to do that. But here's a bonus when we think about doing that. Here's a bonus about giving time to God in prayer. And that is that the devil will lose a lot of his power to tempt us when we spend time in prayer. And you all know that's true. Okay? If we're ignoring God's word, if the devil has more opportunity against us. If we're ignoring <laughs> communing with God, the devil has more opportunity against us. And I think two reasons for that uh, are uh, the influence of the Word of God in our lives and the Holy Spirit being able to use the Word of God in our lives and what the Lord is communing to us about as we pray. We make ourselves vulnerable, you know, like we're laying down our shield, so to speak, at that point. And Jesus modeled that for us, didn't he? That the devil has less opportunity to tempt because when he was laboring in prayer, and even before he was, you know, tempted for 40 days and 40 nights, we read about in the Gospels. You know, he was in prayer before that, and he was in prayer during that time. Because he was in prayer, the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit helps us recall truths, and Jesus would recall Scripture, and he would say that to the enemy, to cast the enemy away from him. Of course, he knew it all in his deity, right? But yet, he would use the Scripture. But Jesus modeled that to us. The next key word we have there is watchful. Watchful, you know, with with your mind awake or keeping alert. You know, it's not like those times where we're doing something, but we're not thinking about it. You ever been that way? Yeah, daydreaming, right? You know, you're doing something, but you're really not thinking about it. For for some guys, not me, I'm really, I'm the perfect example. You need to really watch me, guys. Uh, you're, you're doing something, and one of your kids, maybe even your wife, will want to talk to you, and, and you're kind of sort of listening out of one ear, and you're doing something over here, or you're they're trying to want you to look at them, and you're kind of sort of watching them while you're watching over there. Yeah. But I think for me, the big one is, uh, is like, you ever done this? I know you have. I'm driving, and how did I get there? It's where I wanted to be. Whoa, I don't remember this and this and this and this and this. That I went past in order to get there, okay? It's like, no, that's not how it's supposed to be when we talk about being watchful in prayer, being alert, having our, our mind awake, you know? It's like, no, we are focused on communing with God, okay? We're watchful in it there. Why do you think as Christians that we should be alert, that we should be watchful. What should we, we be alert for? I'll give you two reasons in your notes. I think the first one is that, well, we should be watchful and alert for Christ's return. And in Luke, he says, be dressed, ready for service. Keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour you don't know when. You don't expect them. You know, if we're alert, we're watchful, we're talking to the Lord, and we anticipate His return, it's not going to catch us by surprise. Like, man, I wish I was doing more for the Lord. No, we're, we're wanting to do more for the Lord. And I think the other one, we talked about it earlier already, is that it, it keeps us alert to Satan's snares, to Satan's attacks. And in 1 Peter, he says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. And the third word he gives us there is be thankful. Okay? Be thankful. In fact, it's the sixth time in Colossians that he mentioned thankfulness. I put the references in your in your notes, but he starts, he says, you know, in verse in chapter one, verse three, he says, I, I'm praying for you. I'm thankful for you. I'm praying for you. He's talking about the believers. And in verse 12 of chapter one, he's thankful that they have been qualified to share in the inheritance. He's thankful for their salvation. He's thankful that they have put their faith and trust in Christ. In chapter two, there in verse seven, he says, I'm thankful that you're growing. That you're being root up, rooted and built up in Him. 
And I'm thankful that you're overflowing with thankfulness for what God has done for you in your life. And in chapter 3, verse 15, he says, you know what? I, I, I am just thankful for you. And I'm thankful that we have the peace of God in our hearts. I'm thankful for that. In chapter 3, verse 17, he says, you know what? I'm thankful that in whatever we do, we can be thankful that God has brought that opportunity to us, that God has brought that into our lives. He says, I, I just want to be thankful for every situation God puts in my life. And he says, you know, in chapter 4 here where we're at, he says, devote yourself to prayer, be watchful, and be thankful. I tell you, in, in Sunday school today, we're in Thessalonians, and we're talking about our love for each other, we're talking about our witness, you know, and you know, it's focusing on our love for each other. But if we don't demonstrate people who are thankful for everything that God brings into our lives, we're not a very good witness either at that point. So we just need to be people who are known not just for love, but for thankfulness, for thankfulness. He goes on and he says, why is thankfulness so important for Christians? And again, I think that thankfulness demonstrates a genuineness of our faith. You know, you have people that complain all the time. It, I hope, you know, we've all complained, right? Let's be straight. You guys know you have. Okay. There have been times we've complained. We lost our focus. We've complained. But when someone's complaining all the time, it's like, get me away from them, right? You know? It's like, I've got time for this. At least I don't want to listen to this complaining all the time. And if we're noticed, if we're known for people, man, they, they, are they thankful for anything? No, one, no one's going to want to be with them. And surely that's not a testimony that someone's going to listen to you to how great it is to know Jesus. Oh, you're, you don't ever seem to be thankful for anything. How could it be so great to know you're Jesus, right? And so we don't, we don't want to be people who are like that. And I think being thankful reveals the value and the power of knowing that it's greater. Am I dead again? Yeah. Oh, great. Oh, now I'm on again. All right. Hey, I'm thankful for that little eruption. There you go. But uh, the value, you know, and the power. Tim sang last week. And afterwards, uh, you know, thank you, Jesus, he sang last week. And, right? Thank you, Jesus, with blood of wine. You know, he, he sang last week. And after, I sat there thinking, Man, this is awesome. And I think I mentioned it to you guys, that that's a prayer of thankfulness. But I looked the lyrics up this week again because I wanted to see that. But thank you, Jesus, for the blood of pride. Thank you, Jesus, that you saved my life. Thank you, Jesus. It goes on and on and on. And as believers, if nothing else is going right, we are so thankful that we know Jesus. Amen. We, we can be there. And so when things are out of our hands and things seem to be out of control, we can focus on the fact that we know Jesus. We can focus on that. We know Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for that. And in spite of anything else, uh, you know, I, I, I was, my mind went to Psalm 23. You've done that? Psalm 23? Everybody knows Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Okay? That means he's walking with me, right? <laughs> You know, he's here with me through whatever it is I'm going through. The Lord is my shepherd. I, it's all right. That's enough. I shall not want. It's enough. But then it goes on and it mentions a lot of those cool things. He makes me lie down in green pastures. In other words, he's, he's caring for me. He leads me beside the still waters. I don't feel very still right now, God, but he cares for me. And the scriptures continue to flow through there. Thankfulness as a believer is so important that we, can have, we need to have that to show the world that we have a hope for today and a heaven is awaiting for us. We have eternal life. And if that's all we got, that's enough. That's enough. You know, I, a Christian counselor friend of mine once was talking to me. And he, and, uh, and he was talking about, well, what do you need? You know, what do you really need in life? Okay, what are your real needs? And so, you know, I, well, I need food. I need air. I need, you, you, and you walk down through those things. He goes, well, really, do you need food? Okay. If you don't have food, what happens? You get hungry. If you continue you don't have any food, what happens? Well, your body begins to break down, and you know, you're starving. You don't have water, what happens? You know, you shrivel like that raisin, right? You know, and if you don't have air, what happens? So if we don't have any of these things, which you think, well, at the core nature of life, I need these things. But... If you don't have any of those things and you have Christ, then you have everything you need. 
because your life will end here, won't it? You will die without the food, without the water, without the air. You will die. You will leave this earth. But if you have Jesus, then you have life eternal. So it was just trying, one of those times, I must have been bad or something, he was talking to me. And just to realize, get your focus where it belongs. Okay? You know, your focus needs to be on Christ. He's everything that you need. I am the bread of life. I am the living water. And as the song goes, you are the air I breathe. He is what we need. And if we focus on our walk with Christ, our relationship with Christ, we're going to be, we're going to be people different than the world. We're going to be someone that the world wants to spend time with. I think Paul was just really teaching the value of being thankful and being thankful in prayer. So are we thankful to God for the most in, in the most intimate times? I think as we're thankful to God in those intimate times in life that we can demonstrate outwardly to those. And that becomes our witness, right? Thankfulness is a bridge to having a great witness with others. And that really brings us to this next point, that connecting with unbelievers is something that's essential for us. It's something that's essential for us in Christian living. He says in verse 3, <coughs> And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message. Whoa, he had a purpose. He had an aim. He had an objective. He had a reason for living. And it wasn't just to pray. It wasn't just to soak things up and be all he could be all by himself and huddling up with his Christian friends, okay? No. He had, a, he had a purpose. He says, pray that God may open a door for our message. And so we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. You know, we've been praying as a church uh, that God would help us reach the city of Stanton for Christ. And, uh, well, we haven't actually used those exact words, have we? Because you can look at both and see if those are not the exact words that are there. Maybe that's what we should be using, Right? Maybe those are the words we should put in there next week, that God would help us reach the city of Stanton for Christ. And we've been praying that, that God would uh, lead us individually to people who we could develop a friendship with, and that God would give us opportunities uh, to share our faith. And that's what Paul is demonstrating through his life to us. He wants to be used to tell people about Christ and that we too need to be praying for open doors. That should be part of our prayer time. Open doors. God, show me who I can speak to and help me to speak about Jesus. And by the way, which is more important? And I want you to forget this, so I put this in your notes. That our church grows numerically or that we're faithful witnesses and examples of Christ so that the people of stand will come to trust in Jesus. Which is more important? Yeah. The latter. The numerical growth of any church, you should just leave that up to the Lord. In Acts 2, he says, the Lord added daily those who were being saved. And if you spend time, you go back to that passage in Acts chapter 2, and you'll read all that the early church was doing. There was such love with each other. There was all this time together with each other. The church was going into the synagogue pretty much every day, meeting people, demonstrating Jesus, speaking about Jesus, sharing Jesus. And the Lord added daily <clears throat> those who are being saved. It's all about sharing the gospel. You know, I was talking with Marissa uh, at the uh, bean, bean auction, and it was like, you know what? There are plenty of people in Stanton who don't know Jesus, who need to know Jesus. There are plenty of people in Stanton who don't go to church anymore. It could be because they know Jesus, but they just don't go to church. Or it's because, again, they don't know Jesus. They don't go to church anymore. Who, who, is, our, who is it we want to reach? Do we want to reach the people who already know Jesus and say, you need to be here with us? Do we want to reach the people who are already going to church somewhere else saying, oh, you need to come be with us? No. No. We don't want to do that. We can't stop people from coming. But we, that's not, that's not should be our focus. Our focus should be the people who aren't going to church, the people who don't know Jesus. That's who we need to be focused on. doesn't mean we don't. I'm not talking to them. They go to church. No. But that should be our aim, that God uses us to reach those who don't know the Lord. Paul was asking for open doors of opportunities. And that was when he was out amongst the community, right? You know, and he's walking the streets and he's shopping the market. Is that what's going on in Paul's life right then? Paul was what? A 
prisoner. Paul was a prisoner. How ironic. Think about it. He's a prisoner, and he's praying for open doors. Okay? It's just kind of interesting. He's praying for open doors of opportunity. He craved the opportunity to be a witness for Jesus, even though he was a prisoner. But he could have been sitting there like, oh, me, poor me. No, no. And we'll see a little bit later the reason. One of the reasons he wasn't poor me, besides the fact that he had the right focus, is he had a lot of the body of Christ supporting him, right? A lot of the body of Christ supporting him. And one way Paul saw as an opportunity to share Jesus then was to encourage other believers to keep on keeping on. And that's why he wrote these letters while he was in prison, the prison epistles. He wants to encourage believers to live for Jesus, that God would use them. He's praying for them. Would you pray for me in chains so I'd be faithful to take whatever opportunity God gives me, even though I'm in chains? Yeah, he, he didn't lose his focus. Let me say to you, there is always a way to be part of of the work of the gospel. I believe that. You need to. There is always a way to be part of the work of the gospel, regardless of your circumstances. Look at Paul. Okay? Regardless of your circumstances. Don't believe that God cannot use you. Don't ever believe that. Because this moment you, you think that, you're done, aren't you? Because you're not even looking and thinking and caring and praying about it. You're just done. So don't ever be that way. Don't stop looking to be used for God and don't stop looking to be used up for Jesus. Don't stop doing that. He goes on in verse 4. He says, Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. He's a prisoner and he's talking about proclaiming. <laughs> of course, it's, it's like being a hero, isn't it? You know, hey, hear ye, hear ye. He's a prisoner. And he's focused on getting the message out. We have no excuse. Holman says, expressing Christ in our lives is vital to an effective witness. But it's not enough. The gospel is a message delivered in words and authenticated by life. Both words and life must be shared. As we engage people, we're showing it in our lives. But we need to be alert to when we need to be open in our mouths. Sometimes we need to open our mouths first. Sometimes not. We just need to be alert. We need to be wise. So if there's an opportunity to speak up, opportunity to tell someone about Jesus, we need to take it. Okay? We need to take it. As Paul says, we need to proclaim it. And don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid of that. You know, I, I thought afterwards, I sent the songs in, uh, on Tuesday that we were going to sing today. And as I was working on this later, I was thinking, oh man, we should have sung verse song 446. Uh, anybody know what that one is? Okay, no one's got the hymn no memorized? Good for you guys. <laughs> There's a story to tell to the nations. Oh, yeah. Okay? I got to thinking about that. I thought, I wonder if that's in the hymn And I look, it is. It's going to be on next week's songs, okay? <laughs> it just has to be. There's a story to tell to the nation that would turn their hearts to the Lord. A story of truth and mercy, I think. A story of peace and love. I forget the rest of it, okay? But yeah, there's a story to tell to the nations. And Paul goes on in verse 5. As we proclaim the gospel, Paul says, Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let me paraphrase it. Speak wisely, don't waste an opportunity. Okay? That's my little paraphrase. Speak wisely. You know, and in general, when we're encountering people who we're going, God, I think I need to say something to this person, there's never a second chance to make a good first impression, is there? Right? You only have one first impression. Now, we can correct our mistakes, don't get me wrong. But there's never a second chance to make a good first impression. So that's why being alert, being watchful, being wise, God, I want to represent you well wherever I go. That's, tough. that's what we want to do. You know, he says in uh, verse 6, in the, in the at verse, he gives a few different words. And the first one says it's to be full of grace. Okay? To be full of grace. And uh, Cohen breaks that down. And he says this, the person 
who has the abundance of life Christ came to bring, can spend virtue lavishly because his resources are plentiful. He says he can care for people unreservedly. The people near him and all over the earth, people of his own creed, color, and nationality, and those of other faiths, races, and nations, because his resources of care are attached to limitless reservoirs of God's care. Full of grace, guys. You don't run out of it if God's the one that's giving it to you. If the God's the one who you're drawing from. You never run out of grace. That person I was talking about who's critical all the time, never seems to be thankful, you can always still be gracious to that person. You don't have to be like Charlie who said, oh man, I can't take this anymore. Okay? No. We never run out of that resource. He goes on and he says, he can afford to be slighted and shunned and hurt because he has enough forgiveness in his heart for any crisis that comes his way. You mean, yeah, I mean that. You mean when, yeah, I mean that. We can afford to be that person of grace regardless of what they have done to us. And he goes on, he finishes and he says, he could squander love upon the undeserving and the unresponsive. Because he knows there will always be more love where the last love came from. Okay. Well, that's a great quote. And that brings us to the next part, which then says, we're full of grace, but then we need to be seasoned with salt. Okay. We need to be seasoned with salt. He says, let your conversation be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so you know how to answer. You know, that seasoned with salt is kind of a favorite a phrase in many applications, doesn't it? You know, in the context, it points to uh, how salt enhances flavor, how salt uh, flavors the food to preserve the food from corruption. And by the way, that's our that's our speech, our conversation. But I'm going to tell you, you as an individual, as a, a believer in Jesus Christ, we're called to be salt and light. And you know what? You're going to find. You probably could all give testimony to this. How your presence among unbelievers who maybe were doing certain things or speaking certain ways, when you're in their presence, they seem to pull back from that type of language or behavior. Because salt is a restraining, or it's a restrainer of evil, a restrainer of corruption. It's really interesting, and I'm sure every one of you can think of times where that's happened. And he says, be that way in how you, you as a believer, React with other people. Be full of grace. Be seasoned with salt. We need to ask ourselves, do I care? Do I care about how my words impact others? Do I care? Now James says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. Okay? Do I care how my words impact others? Especially unbelievers. Do I care? You know, and when I'm not full of grace... Remember that? Never a second chance to make good first impression. It's like, man, but I have blown it too many times in my life. But you can go back and show humility, show what a Christian does in confession and asking forgiveness. You can do those things. But do I care? Do I care if what I say will help or hinder my witness for Christ? Do I care? And if I do, I'm going to be doing a whole lot of thinking before I speak. Okay? I'm going to be doing a whole lot of praying before I encounter with people. I don't want to be the guy, again, I've been the guy. <laughs> I don't want to be the guy anymore where someone has to say, dude, man, give some thought to your words, Charlie. You know, you know we, we were <laughs> in Sunday school today uh, in the passage in Thessalonians. Uh, how, what, was, what was the wording again? In... Uh, yeah, mind your own business, okay? It's like, and he's just trying to think, you know, don't be busy about it. Just mind your own business. It's kind of like someone coming up to me and saying, man, dude, what were you thinking? Think before you speak. You know, that was an encouragement. You need to mind your own business. Charlie, you didn't think before you speak. What, what, what were you thinking? You blew it, man. You're blowing it here. 
Or even, don't you care? I mean, if someone had to correct me on my language and what I'm saying to people, it's happened. Believe it or not, it's happened. People have corrected me over my life. It hasn't been in many, many years because I've reached safehood. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you laugh? <laughs> oh, man. Hey, listen. It's not the response we want others to have about what we say. And it's surely not the response that we want from Jesus, right? You know, Paul says, we want to hear well done, right? Not what have you done, right? You know, well done, you know, Christian servant. You know. Then he says, know how to answer. Okay? And if you compare this to a passage in 1 Peter there, 1 Peter 3, in 1 Peter 3 he says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer. Hey, there, again, think before you encounter, think before you... Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that you have. By the way, people aren't going to be asking you for the reason the hope you have. If, if you're demonstrating someone that doesn't have anything they, they would want, right? He says, do this with gentleness and respect, Okay? That sounds like grace and good seasoning, right? He says, keeping a clear conscience so that, you, so that those who speak maliciously against you, against your good behavior in Christ, may be ashamed of their slander. People have criticized me. People have criticized you. But if we know that what we have said or what we are doing is what God wants for us to say or to do, then it's okay, right? But God's saying, you know what? They'll be ashamed for it. It's okay. We don't need to retaliate to people who don't like something we have said or something we have done. You know, that's that's fine. We're doing this for the Lord. Remember, John 3, 17, that God did not send His Son into the world to condemn, right? But to save. And we need to be the people who respond in a way so that they can know Christ, that they can be saved. Let me finish up this passage. It's kind of like the final greetings where everybody is saying hello. And uh, it, what it really shows, what these next verses, this group of uh, 10 verses or so, what it really shows is how much the body of Christ needs each other. That's really what it shows. And you can read that. Read that and, and thinking about it. I'm going to read it to you. But thinking about this really shows how much the body of Christ needs each other. And we need each other so that we can live out our faith more effectively. We need each other for that. We need each other so that we can help one another be strong in life's trials. We need each other so that we can spur one another on in love and in good deeds. We need each other. And Paul mentioned each person here that helped him be strong. That helped him fight through difficulties that come from sharing Jesus. You know, Paul wouldn't have had many difficulties if he wasn't all about sharing Jesus. Yeah, most of his problems would have went away. But he was focused on sharing Jesus. And we read that Paul was thankful for, the, for their encouragement. Paul was thankful for their support. And he was thankful that they too were faithful to the cause of Jesus Christ. And he was thankful that they weren't giving up the fight. He wasn't giving up the fight, and he was thankful they weren't giving up the fight either. Listen to this here. He says, Tychius will tell you all the news about me. Now, he couldn't do that if he wasn't there helping Paul, right? Yeah. He says, he's a dear brother, a faithful minister, and fellow servant of the Lord. Boy, from the Apostle Paul, that is quite an accurate. That is quite an accolade. He says, I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances, that he may encourage your hearts. He was encouraging Paul's. He's coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. And they will tell you everything that is happening here. He says, my fellow prisoner, our Aristarchus, I can't, I'm, I'm doing a, I'm doing a, one of those here. Aristarchus, I can't get it. I should have, I should have did the, the Google pronunciation first, right? 
Uh, he sends his greetings. What was he? A fellow prisoner. Okay. He probably came to faith through Paul's witness. But he's sending greetings to people he's never met as a brother in Christ. He says, he sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is also called Justice, sends his greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God. And they have proved a comfort to me. I think it's interesting. Co-worker. Alright? Remember, Paul is what? A prisoner. But he's, he is engaged in the work of the gospel. Even though he can't go out, they can. And he is a co-worker with them. A co-laborer with them. They're being his voice where he can't be that voice. They're encouraging him where he needs to be encouraged. And these believers, they were an encouragement, a companion, a comfort. But what were they not to Paul? They were not an added stress on his life. Right? And we don't want to be that way to one another. Oh man, I'm going to go there and I'm going to see Becky again. What's she going to say now? Sorry, dear. I, I didn't dare pick on anyone else. Okay. <laughs> but I feel like picking on people. So if I ever pick on you, it's only because I love you, right? Yeah. Amen. 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 But he, they were an encouragement. They were a companion. They were a comfort. They were not added stress to Paul's life. He goes on, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He's always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. Wow. Sounds like he cared for those people in these churches as much as Paul. I think Paul taught him well. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Heropolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas also send greetings. And so give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and Nymphia and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see to it that it's also read in the church of Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. You know, something to note about this group. I put this in your notes. You've got to fill in some blanks though. It says, Aristocharis was a Macedonian Jew. Okay? Onesimus was a slave. Epaphras, well, he's a native Colossian pastor. And Nympha was a Laodicean woman. And women weren't thought highly of, right? This list of believers then shows us that the effect of the gospel, it knows nothing about social, nothing about racial boundaries. Everyone. And when we think about who we're going to share Christ with, who we're willing to show love to, who we're willing to reach out to, who we're just willing to speak to, there should be nothing about anybody that would prevent us from opening up our mouths to them. Never, never qualifying, well, I don't know about that person. No, nothing. It's effective. It's effective. The gospel is effective to anybody who would receive it. And we need to be people who would share it that way. And in verse 17, he says, See to it that you complete the ministry. Okay? You complete the ministry you have received of the Lord. So here's the question. Do you believe that God still has work for you to complete? Okay? I, I think that's the charge, I mean, that we have there. What would Paul say to you? What would Paul say to you? What would he say to me? Well, in fact, since this is the inspired word of God, then it seems reasonable that this charge here that he's given to our Archippus to complete the ministry is the same challenge and it's applicable to every believer who is breathing air on this earth. That we have a ministry that God has called us to. We're told that we are ambassadors for Christ, right? Right? As if God is making his appeal through us. We all have a ministry. Sometimes that ministry is on the front lines, opening our mouths to those who don't know Jesus. Sometimes that ministry is encouraging brothers and sisters in Christ because we 
we don't have certain abilities or certain opportunities to be on the front lines at those times. Whatever it is, we all have a ministry. We all have people that we minister to. It could be neighbors next to us who we see every week who don't know Christ and they're as far as we can get from our house. That's our ministry. I could go on. Okay. Do you believe that God still has a work for you to accomplish? Paul would give the same challenge to each of us. Complete the ministry. There is no quitting. Okay? I'm telling you that. Some people might say, well, I've reached a certain age. No. There is no quitting if we're committed to the cause. There just isn't. No quitting when we're committed to the cause. So continue to live on our faith and share Christ as often as we can. You know, there are years ago, uh, Reverend, Phil, uh, Reverend Bruce Dunn, uh, in the Peoria area, I don't know if anybody knew Bruce Dunn, but he was pastor of Presbyterian Church in Peoria, and he gave a message, I, I read a message, or I heard a message from Bruce Dunn uh, years ago uh, about the, uh, the, the uh, John 15, okay? The vine and the branches. And that being used of God was a challenge that was coming through there. And in there, he gave an illustration about his water faucet. Okay? And he had this water faucet that he would go to, and this water faucet would give him water for cooking, this water faucet would give him water for drinking, whatever he needed, the water faucet was there. And uh, one day he was walking through his kitchen and he looked over and he saw his water faucet. His water faucet looked really like sad and discouraged. You know, doesn't your water faucet change its image on? You know? And it's sad and discouraged. Like, my goodness, water faucet. What's the matter today with you? Why you look so down? What's going on? Oh, master, I remember how you would come to me and give me take water from me to... To, to, to give you a cool drink and get, take water from me to cook and take water from me for other reasons. It's been so long since you've taken water from me. He goes, oh, you silly water faucet. Okay? I knew you were there. And if I needed you to fill a glass of water, I knew you were always willing and ready to do that. Ah, you're just a silly water faucet. I, 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 I know. Okay. We need to be a silly water faucet, right? There are times where you think, I don't know how God's going to use me. Well, be a silly water faucet. Just be willing. Just be ready. Always be able. Okay? And let God call you silly. Okay? Amen. But don't get discouraged, right? Don't get discouraged on that. But, yeah. Paul, he finishes up in verse 18. He says, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hands. <coughs> And he says, remember my chains. Okay. He needed encouragement. He needed the brothers and sisters to be praying for him. He, had, he was so limited in his opportunity, he wanted more opportunity. He could easily be discouraged and depressed. He didn't want to be that way. He says, remember my chains. And I, I think here's Paul, shackled in prison. And he doesn't make excuses for his circumstances. I think it's the point. Remember my chains. I think it's twofold. I'm not making excuses. Remember, guys, I'm in chains. I'm not making excuses for my circumstances. I'm going to do whatever I can do. And then remember my chains because it's hard. It's difficult. Okay? He says, remember my chains. And that should be a motivation for each of us. Paul took on challenges. Uh, even though his circumstances were limited, would limit him, and even though he knew his time was short, okay, his time was short in this life, he didn't back down from challenges. You know, in preparing this, my mind went to Todd Beamer. Remember Todd Beamer? Todd was on Flight 93 that on 9-11 went down in Pennsylvania that was headed for the White House. They, they found that out because what were these passengers doing? They're on the phones with their loved ones. They're finding out two other planes that hit towers, and, and they realize now that they knew they were taking hijack, and they put two and two together and thought, we got to do something. We got to do something. And uh, he gathered some brave passengers together who took on the enemy. Okay? Took on the enemy. And they knew their time was short if they did nothing. They didn't survive, did they? 
but they were used to protect lives, preserve lives. That flight went down in a field, it never hit the White House, right? They pre protected those lives that were out there. They took advantage of that. And Todd's final words that his wife heard him say on the phone, were she, what she said were familiar words that he would use in business and in life when he was faced with challenges. Uh, and remember those words? It was, let's roll. Let's go do it. Okay? Let's go do it. And I think uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, like him, we need to look for opportunities to share the gospel message. We need to be willing to face the challenges we face. And I think Paul, uh, if he knew Todd Beamer, he might have put up there, let's keep rolling. Okay? Let's keep rolling. Uh, keep pressing on. Run the race to win it. Run to win the prize that's out there. So as we continue on this journey, guys, for Christ, uh, it's important that we're in prayer. It's important that we connect with unbelievers. And it's important that we're caring for one another. Amen? Amen? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that's the truth. And that we can trust it, God, to guide our lives. Help us to be people who care about living for you and helping others come to know Jesus.